It's autumn 1970. With the band's spiritual leader, Anthony Phillips, now departed, the four-man Genesis are at a crossroads with the very existence of the band in jeopardy. With newly recruited drummer Phil Collins now in the band, they played several shows as a four-piece before being joined by new guitarist Mick Barnard. Whilst not quite the peak best of Genesis, Barnard is believed to be responsible for writing the guitar parts for the second half of the musical box song, with the first half of that song belonging to Anthony Phillips. Barnard was also filmed in a now lost BBC TV recording. This is possibly an image of him from that time. It's been said that Barnard didn't quite adapt to the 12 string guitar playing and was asked to leave the band. Afterwards, Barnard went on to form his own musical electronics company. This image here definitely is Mick Barnard. In December 1970, Steve Hackett placed an advert in the Melody Maker newspaper, touting for work. He'd been placing ads there for several years, but this one, perhaps because of its wording and the allusion to the track's stagnation, caught the eye of Peter Gabriel. A few weeks after the Melody Maker advert, and Peter and Tony Banks visited Steve and listened to him play three audition tracks. The first was a flute-based folk track. The second, some weird freeform jazz in the style of what became later the waiting room. And the third was a blues number. The strength of this performance was enough to persuade the band to hire him. The year 1970 ended in frantic fashion, with the band seemingly crisscrossing the country each day playing a series of small concerts. The band has frequently referenced the fact that one of the concerts played around this time was attended by only three people. On the 14th of January, after only a week rehearsing, Steve Hackett nervously played his first gig with Genesis. He has later recalled being so stage struck that he literally sat alone on the stage at the end of the show not really knowing when or even how to leave the stage. The gigs around this time were often bundled together as part of Charisma Records' Six Bob or 30 Pence a Ticket Tour with the band's Lindisfarne and Van de Graaff Generator, with Genesis very much playing third billing to these other more prominent bands. February saw the band play in the Rainbow Theatre in London for the first time, and the following month they played their first gig overseas. Somehow Genesis had become popular in Belgium and they headed off there along with their roadie come band manager Richard McPhail. McPhail is without doubt the unsung hero of the early Genesis days. It's hard to know how they would have survived without him. McPhail booked them to play in an abandoned farmhouse to a group of young fans who apparently knew every word of their songs. Incredibly, this whole gig was recorded and it thus shares a claim for being not only Genesis's first audience bootleg, but also the only known recording of the song The Light. This was thought to be a Phil Collins song that contained elements that would later turn up in the Lamb's Lily White Lilith and also the Colony of Slippermen. The day after this show, 
and the band headed off to Belgian TV studios. Now this is not the familiar footage that we all know. That came from a later 1972 appearance. The 71 footage is believed to be lost. The whole enterprise was enough to take the Trespass album to number one in the Belgian charts. Exactly how many sales this took is unknown, but the band revisited the country there several times over the following year. April and May, Seymour continued touring by the band, including a session at the BBC Radio Studios. June was noted for a gig at the Friars Club. This is where Peter Gabriel embarked on some impromptu stage diving, jumping into the crowd and breaking his ankle. He did however recover in time to perform at the Reading Festival at the end of that month. With the constant touring depriving the band of any serious songwriting time together, in July they decided to take time off and retreated to Luxford House, a huge stately home that was rented by Charisma Records boss Tony Stratton Smith. The band's Charisma stablemates Van de Graaff also played and rehearsed there and they can be pictured in the grounds of this house in the gatefold sleeve of their Paul Hearts album. Around this time, Steve Hackett persuaded the band to buy a Mellotron from none other than Robert Fripp. Hackett and Banks went to meet Fripp in Crimson's usual basement rehearsal studio in London's Fulham Palace Road. Knowing the unreliability of these machines, King Crimson actually had several spares and sold Genesis a fire damaged one that they had. One has to consider the price of these machines at this time was not far off the average price of a house. Genesis was sat on a wealth of unreleased tracks at this point. It's unknown just how many of these titles turned into other tracks that we know today. For example, the track I've been travelling all night long went through several title changes before being finally known as Can Utility and the Coastliners. The track Anyway from the Lamb and Nursery Crime's Fountain of Sarmasas are also in this list somewhere, but under other names. In terms of imagining how Nursery Crime could have turned out, we can perhaps discount most of these tracks and leave us with a selection that we know were either recorded professionally or played live up to the mid-1971 point when the album was recorded. Of these, a final list shows us perhaps what is the most plausible selection of tracks that didn't but could have made it onto the final record. Happy the Man at Twilight Alehouse a well-known single B-Sides. Silver Song was later fully recorded with writer Anthony Phillips with Phil Collins singing. The track The Light has already been discussed here and was another stage favourite. But it's the track Wooden Mask that is perhaps the most intriguing. This track's been described as having a swinging, hymn-like feel to it. Now from this description, I think this could be a variation on the fabled Jackson's Tape song, Resignation. It's playing now. It was planned to be a B-side 
to a single release for another stage favourite, Going Out To Get You. That track had been re-recorded in the same session as Wooden Mask, but in a much heavier style. Unfortunately the single release was scrapped, and both of these recordings, like so much from this era, is now considered lost. Let's now look at the tracks that did make it onto the final nursery crime record. This track has its origins in a 1969 Anthony Phillips piece, known simply as F Sharp. This is essentially the strumming acoustic opening. It was then developed a year later as part of the Jackson's tape soundtrack. This was incidental music that the band had been commissioned by the BBC for a documentary on a painter called Mick Jackson. For this the band were given notes on the rough themes that this still unreleased documentary were to involve. For example, this sequence had notes that suggested a sequence showing sensual paintings. With images that involved tossing hair, grimacing faces and violent lovemaking. These production notes also gave the title Manipulation. And one can't help think that some of these themes led directly to the dark and sexual undertones of the final musical box lyrics. The song took over a year to create, with the initial Phillips idea being built on after he'd left by the Four Man Genesis. They used to play it on stage with Banks doubling up the guitar parts on his keyboards. It was when Mick Barnard arrived that it was further developed with the latter guitar section. So by the time Steve Hackett arrived, the song was more or less complete. He effectively just plays their parts. He does however interpret them brilliantly. It was also Hackett's idea to add the kind of musical motif of a musical box. In a sense, this song is unique in the Genesis catalogue in having a legitimate claim to having a seven-man writing credit. Gabriel has claimed that the lyrics were inspired by dark Victorian novels like Great Expectations and The Turn of the Screw. It sets a tone for an album that was like stepping inside into the dark and the shadows as opposed to the light and sunshine of Trespass. When played live, Gabriel would tell the story of the song's central characters, Cynthia and Henry. Cynthia beheads her brother Henry with a croquet mallet, only for him to return as an aged ghostly apparition from a musical box. It took about two years before Gabriel was to appear in the old Henry mask to demand that Cynthia touches him. The track is absolute classic early Genesis, and along with Supper's Ready and The Cinema Show, perhaps takes a claim to be their greatest ever song. Sunday at six when they closed both the gates, a widowed pair still sitting there wonder if they're late for church this shares the same writing credits as the future blood on the rooftops with hackett's music being accompanied by phil collins lyrics it's thought that banks and rudderford added some guitar to this song so it leaves peter gabriel as the only band member completely absent from the track 
It's our first introduction to Colin singing for the band, and I feel this song is at least equal to, if not better, than the later More Fool Me. The two new band recruits paint a pleasant picture of quaint and rural English life. The song was a conscious effort to distance itself from the traditional boy-girl love songs. Instead, this song focuses on two elderly ladies visiting church and reminiscing about their lost husbands. The days when they were four instead of the now two. Hackett has said that the inspiration for this song came from the Beatles' Eleanor Rigby. But it comes across sounding a bit more like Crosby, Stills and Nash. It's a charming number that provides a restful calm between the fury of the musical box and what's about to come next. track in the same mould as the knife, in what could be described as a kind of proto-heavy metal. The song originated during the brief four-man genesis period, with Banks playing the guitar parts on keyboards. It took new recruit Steve Hackett, however, to truly make the song come to life, with some phenomenal playing in his trademark fretboard tapping style. Contrary to popular belief, Hackett did not invent this style of playing. Here's some footage from guitarist Vittorio Camadesi from 1965 and Roy Schmeck from back in the 30s. In keeping with the theme of Victorian menace that this album has, the hogweed plant itself was introduced to Britain in the early 1800s and soon escaped and spread widely across the country. The plant has a dreaded sting that can result in either horrific blistering, blindness and even death. Its official botanical name, of course, is Heracleum mantigazi, the line that Gabriel sings at the end of the song. The title itself was featured in a newspaper article from 1969 but it's unknown if this is what influenced Gabriel directly. It has a similar narrative that would be repeated with Get Em Out By Friday and the Battle of Epping Forest, but I feel this works much better here. It doesn't suffer from Gabriel's overabundance of words, with the balance of words and music and space being just right. Seven stones lay on the ground Within the seventh house a friend was found And the changes of no consequence Will pick up the rains from nowhere Nowhere This song is a kind of historical allegory Reminiscent of the style of the Trespass album its lyrics tell of three different kind of Aesop's fables. The first is that of a tinker. These were people who traveled from village to village, mending metalwork and such. The tinker finds seven stones on the ground. These stones are a good omen for him because it's in the seventh house that he visits that he finds shelter from a storm. The middle story concerns sailors who are also sheltering from the perils at sea. On seeing a passing bird, the captain steers his boat a different way and thus avoids rocks. It's unknown if he steered away from or towards the bird, or even if the bird made any difference to the ship's fate. The final part of the story tells of a farmer duped by a wily old man. 
the farmer buys his advice but receives none, except perhaps for the fact that other people's advice should not be so readily paid for. These lyrics paint a similar picture to The Lamb's Chamber of 32 Doors, with both of these songs being co-written by the same three band members. Essentially this is a Banks and Gabriel song, with Hackett contributing the bridge part The World Only Grieves Him. Seth and Stones was issued as a B-side to the Happy The Man single, and I feel it's very much one of the great unsung heroes of the Genesis catalogue. Before looking at the next track, I'm going to pause and just reflect on the rough, and I mean rough categories, that Genesis songs tend to fall into. The Trespass album includes, and I'm quoting Mike Rutherford here, some ballsy driving songs, wistful ballads, kind of multi-segmented history songs, but nothing from the comedy category. Now, I admit this is a crude method of categorising such an eclectic band like Genesis with many of their songs overlapping these categories. But it does perhaps show how Nursery Crime did advance from Trespass, with the band now having the confidence to include a quirky comedy number, something that they would do on practically every subsequent album. Here is Harold the Barrel. A well-known Bogna restaurant owner Disappeared early this morning. This is Gabriel's first and arguably finest comedy storytelling song. And one can really sense the enjoyment that he and Phil Collins had in laying down the vocal track. <laughs> Apparently they sang it at the same time together, with their two vocal tracks being cemented together in the final mix. Hasn't got a leg to stand on. They both employ a kind of cockney swagger that would be revisited in later songs like Epping Forest and Robbery, Assault and Battery. Again, it perfectly captures the kind of dark Victorian underworld with its Punch and Judy vocal style effects on the policeman. The musical arrangement is just wonderful and it goes through many tempo changes. The main storyline bounces along briskly to the pace of Banks' pounding piano. There's a brief melancholy reflection where Harold ponders jumping from the window. If I was many miles from here I'd be sailing in an open boat on the sea Instead I'm on this window ledge with the whole world below The song also considers the reaction from the crowd some of whom wanted to step down, and others to take a running jump. We can help you! We can help you! Finally, Harold jumps, and we have a haunting section that blends perfectly into the next track. It's a superb number that again shows that this band were going to give the listeners something different with each track. This delicate ballad was almost exclusively written by Mike Rutherford. It comes across like more of a leftover from the Trespass album. In later years, he's come to dismiss this song as being something he says is a little dodgy. He regrets some of the lyrics and some of the playing. Banks has also become quite critical of this song. Now placed in the context of the early 1970s and the popularity of folk music at that time, I would say it stands up pretty well. The lyrics evoke images of the passing seasons, with summer, 
fading into autumn. It's a short and sweet number that would sometimes replace the song Happy the Man as the live show opener. At this time the band liked to start their sets with quiet numbers and built up to heavier ones as their set progressed. originally written by Banks while he briefly attended university. And the final track on the album showcases brilliant performances by everyone in the band. Like the musical box, it originated in the Mick Jackson art documentary. Hackett has claimed that the opening was originally called Ketch. Now I'm inclined to see this as a mistyping or a mispronunciation of the word sketch, especially when you consider that this documentary was about a painter with the kind of hurried playing of the opening notes, kind of suiting that feel. The track is often cited by the band as an example of how their studio recordings never quite managed to capture the live versions. And to a degree, Fountain of Salmasus does sound flat and more laboured than when it was brought to life on stage. Like much of this album, the lyrics bear all the hallmarks of young men, more versed in the world of geography and history and mythology than sex, drugs and rock and roll. Within our hidden cave, nymphs had kept a child. Um, Aphroditus, son of gods, so afraid of Ella. Mount Ida does indeed rise like an island out of the tall dark pinewood forest on the Greek island of Crete. It's here that we find the Greek legend Hermaphroditus, son of the gods Hermes and Hermaphrodite. Hermaphroditus lived in the forests where he encountered a group of water-dwelling nymphs, one of whom was called Sarmasus. She enticed the young man into the waters whereby his and her bodies became fused as one, part male, part female. It's a Greek myth that Genesis would return to with the song The Lamia, and to a degree the track The Lady Lies. One gets the impression that these nubile vamps from ancient times were perhaps the only real women that the band actually knew around this time. The two are now made one, demigod and nymph are now made one. The actual site of the fountain was apparently rediscovered by archaeologists in Turkey in the 1990s where they found ancient inscriptions telling the story in Greek. The song is a wonderful example of the way the Genesis could take the listener on a journey, and it's a fitting ending to an album that is woven together with both historical and mythological themes. This album cover was the second in a trilogy of covers by artist Paul Whitehead. The lawn and the house are based on Gabriel's family home, and it pictures a kind of Alice in Wonderland like Cynthia. She's the character from the musical box song, with her brother Henry's head on the floor. The picture was made to look older by varnishing it and letting it set out in the sun. In doing so, 
some actual flies became stuck on the canvas and were left there when it was finally photographed. The actual painting itself was apparently stolen in the 1980s from the Charisma Records officers. Now personally, I would really think twice about stealing such a striking artwork, especially knowing that it was intertwined with themes of Victorian ghosts and haunting Greek fate. I hope the painting got its revenge. It's a fantastic piece of art that really puts the listener into the bygone world that the music creates. And when I say bygone world, I don't mean the world of the 1970s, I mean the world of the 1870s. The cover and its inner gatefold are pure Victoriana. And Whitehead stakes a claim to devising the album's title. To promote the album, a full page advert was taken out to a melody maker featuring a review by then Messiah Keith Emerson. Despite this incredible accolade and the band's rising live popularity at that time, the album still failed to chart and only sold about 10,000 copies on its first release in November 71. Despite this failure at home, the album sold much better in Belgium and now Italy, where it reached number four in the charts. This prompted an Italian tour in April 1972 that started that country's great love affair with this band and English prog rock in general. It was some time prior to this tour that Peter Gabriel decided to shave the middle parting in his head. This was the beginning of a new era for the band and with the help of his wife's dress, Peter Gabriel's onstage appearance and the band's fortunes would soon completely transform. So there you have it, the album that without doubt puts Genesis on the map. The story of nursery crime. <laughs>